And thank you, Michael. Uh, you're Dr. Didway. It's my friend Michael for a lot of years in a lot of places, and uh, so I'm thankful to be here at Anderson University at uh, his invitation uh, because I so respect the work that he has done, particularly through Preaching Magazine, encouraging uh, preachers uh, through that important work, but also in uh, encouraging those on the writing of preaching and, and advising of preaching for so many years. So I'm very thankful for his ministry, and you have a, a treasure here at Anderson in uh, Michael Didway, who I'm uh, very appreciative of. Let me begin our time by telling you I'm going to talk about application, which we think of as a component of preaching. And for those of you who are in ministry preparation or in ministry or a doctor of ministry program, you, you recognize that application is sometimes pictured as the antithesis of the grace of the gospel. After all, grace is about getting to do whatever we want, and application is about doing what God wants. And somehow people put those two things at opposite ends of the preaching obligation. And my goal in our three lectures is to talk to you about how the grace of the gospel is actually the fuel of application when it is rightly perceived. And just a way of thinking about that may be to piggyback on what I know you all have talked a lot about in this year as we celebrate with Protestant Christians worldwide the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. This week, you recognize, that's, that's this week. Um, Martin Luther was not the only contributor to that movement. One of the important pre-Reformation figures, that means uh, he was not fully in the way, nor in many ways representative of what we wish, but nonetheless was catching part of the Reformation spirit, was Michelangelo Caravaggio. Michelangelo Caravaggio painted one of the most revolutionary paintings of the pre-Reformation period in 1601 called The Supper at Emmaus. Now you may remember the road to Emmaus. We talk about it a lot. After the resurrection, Jesus appears to his disciples and for reasons that we don't quite understand, the disciples do not recognize who he is. But Luke tells us what the discussion was about. Do you remember? Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus revealed what was said in all the scriptures, the things concerning what? Himself. If we were to just take the, the big timeline of scripture and we were to say what, what has and will unfold in the timeline of scripture, one quick way that scholars sometimes capture the overall narrative is say, uh, God made everything good at creation. At creation, everything was made good. Didn't last that way, right? Very soon there was a fall in which everything went bad. And we know it's at the other end of the story, right? At the other end of the story is the eternal consummation in which everything is made perfect, which, by the way, is even better than good. And the question we have to say is, what happens in between? Between the fall, when everything went bad, and the consummation, where everything is made perfect, what is happening in the meantime? And typically, we talk about this as the period of redemption. Right? We have creation, fall, redemption, and ultimate consummation. Redemption is not happening all at once. There is an unfolding plan of the grace of God getting bigger and bigger, and it culminates, of course, in the person and the work of Christ. That's what Jesus said, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he revealed what was said in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And that's not just Jesus' conclusion. That is even Moses' prophecy. After all, what happens here at the fall? Genesis 3.15, what does God declare to the tempter? I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. You're going to do what? Strike his heel. What's he going to do? crush your head. And from that moment, it is 
game on. The great unfolding revelation is that there is a king who will come and he will crush the head of Satan. And that is what the rest of the story is about. It's not just a bunch of commands and stories about moral people. No, there is a, a direction. There is a purpose. There's an unfolding revelation so that the Lord Jesus, after the cross, can look back over the scope of history and can say to his disciples, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he revealed what was said in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. It's not saying every verse mentions Jesus. That's not the point. But there is a flow of the grace of God that is being unfolded. And it's that understanding that Caravaggio pictures. After all, after the road to Emmaus, there is the supper at Emmaus. And you may remember that at the supper, the disciples who have not recognized Jesus suddenly say, this is him. Remember, what is that most Christ-like thing that Jesus does at the supper at Emmaus, where the disciples suddenly go, that's Jesus. What does he do? He breaks the bread. And in the breaking of the bread, they say, that's him. Now, it's that moment of the breaking of the bread that Caravaggio pictures in such a revolutionary way. Now, what makes the painting revolutionary? Well, among other things, neither Jesus nor his disciples have halos against the conventions of the era. Nor do they have beards the way aristocrats would have had in the time of Caravaggio. They are clean shaven, which means they can wash off the sawdust and the fish guts because they're just working people. But beyond that, Caravaggio does not capture the disciples who see this as Jesus and just kind of sit back in glassy-eyed wonder, go, oh, isn't this wonderful? Instead, they are rising from their seats. Their muscles are taut. They are ready for action. One of the disciples actually reaches toward you as the onlooker and tries to pull you closer to Jesus with the expression of his hands, as if they are all saying, if this is this Jesus, if this is the fulfillment of the ages, if this is the desire of nations, if this, if this is the fulfillment of all the ages of prophecy before us, then there's something to do about this. There, there's a response to this gospel of grace that they feel compelled to express. And what I intend to say to you is that's precisely what should happen for us today. That if we have understood the unfolding message of the gospel, then that is not saying to us, well, you know, just sit back and absorb that. That there's a compulsion of the gospel, rightly apprehended, that moves our souls, our hearts, to respond to the one who has loved us. After all, John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do what? You'll keep my commands. If God has shown us such great love, there is a, a chemistry of the heart that begins to stir and wants to respond. And in preaching, if you think about that, that, that stirred response we call technically application. If you think about what, what is application, I want to say some obvious and then kind of break some thoughts of what we may be talking about when we discuss application. An old definition, for those of you who are London Confession or Westminster Confession background, simply says, what, what do the scriptures principally teach? So if you're saying, what, what do these scriptures principally teach? And the answer to that catechism question is, what man is to believe concerning God, doctrine, and what duty God requires of man? Not one or the other, but both. Application, as it were, is what is the duty that is a response to the doctrine? That's kind of the technical definition. We can put it in more common terms. Application is the personal consequence of biblical truth. It's the personal consequence of biblical truth. And when you say it that way, you begin to understand why the doctrine duty polarities actually have to be broken a little bit because theologically application not just is the personal consequence it's the significance of biblical truth a great question that those who teach preaching and the philosophy of meaning is 
Do you really understand what something means if you don't know the significance of it? Do you really know what something means? I know what the Trinity means. I, I know that the just you know, are saved by faith, that, 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 that justification is by faith alone. Okay, why'd you tell me that? Justification is by faith alone. Great principle of rest. Justification is by faith alone. Why'd you tell me that? Well, because justification is by faith alone. Okay, got it. Why, why is that important? Well, because justification is by faith alone. No, you don't get it. What difference does that make in my life? Because if you can't communicate that to me, or I don't understand what's the significance of this, I really do not understand what that means. I may be able to get the answer on the test, but if what happens when I am convicted by the Holy Spirit of my sin is I think I'm going to be made right with God because I'm going to pray more this week, read my Bible more, and go to church more. Or the more common response, I feel bad or longer, so I'll make it up to God. What did you just say? Justification is by feeling bad or longer. No, it's not. Justification is by faith alone. It is responding to the reality that you are crucified and you no longer live. So what you do is not in that equation. But Christ lives. Where does he live? In me. In the life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Not in my bad feelings, not in my prayers, not in my accomplishments, but what he did. My faith is always in the accomplished cross work of Jesus. And therefore, I'm responding in new obedience. I am not gaining grace by my obedience. And therefore, evaluating, am I okay with God on the basis of my performance? Because if you evaluate your relationship with God based on your performance, you will either despair or fall into pride. Those are the only two human alternatives. Just because, what's the significance of what you've said? Ultimately, application is helping people understand the personal consequence, the significance of what we just taught from the scriptures. That means that application involves attitude as well as behavior. In the teaching of preaching, often people think that application is just what you do in response to the text. It includes that, but it is not exclusively that. Out of the heart are the issues of life. If you think of the preachers that you love listening to, I will tell you that the ones you probably most want to listen to are not those who have been preaching two years or three years or five years, but 25 or 30 years. And often it's because they've made a transition in their preaching. Almost always when we start out preaching, we are about behaviors, right? Do this, don't do that. Go to this website, don't go to the, that website. Date that person, don't date that person. Do this, we, we establish boundaries and practices are the focus of our early preaching. And then you listen to someone who's been preaching 25, 30 years. And you find it's not that behaviors are absent from their preaching. But they recognize if I get behavior change without heart change, I got nothing. And so they're after the heart. They're after the heart. And it's why I need to say to you that application is about attitude as well as it is about behavior. How important is application? Here it becomes important to talk about the, uh, the person for whom this lectureship is named. John Broadus. Okay, John Broadus, we sometimes refer to in this country as the father of expository preaching. Now, just a quick history, and I'll do this because they are the broadest lectures and because Mike didn't ask me, but I'm going to just tell you how important John Broadus is in the history of preaching, not just for North America, but for the world. So um, you're in the post-Civil War era. John Broadus is teaching preaching to Baptist people at, at uh, the future of what he hopes will be uh, the Christian faith in America. But there's a problem. And the problem, much like our era, you know, history repeats itself, is that the Christian consensus is breaking down in North America. 
And the reason that the Christian consensus is breaking down is because of higher criticism coming from Europe, particularly from Germany, in which there are people who are using God language, but not meaning God things anymore. Okay? So the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, well, scientific, modern people know that that didn't happen. His teachings rose from the dead. It's as though he never died. And the notion of the physical resurrection, the notion that there was a child born of a virgin who lived a sinless life to give himself an atoning death for the sins of his people and to show that that atonement was real, he rose from the dead physically and will come again in power and glory. You just take it for granted. So do the people of Broadus' era, but there were people coming undone, saying God language things and not believing that truth at all. What allowed that to happen was a form of preaching in Broadus' day, which we typically now call topical preaching. They would have called it theological or exegetical preaching in the sense that what normally happened was you would take a verse out of Scripture and to show your scholarship, to show how facile you were, not just with the text, but with the philosophy of the age, you, you would kind of riff philosophically on that verse. Okay? And you would talk about the implications, and you would prove what that verse meant from this passage, and that passage, and this philosopher, and that author, and this prose, and that poetry. And you would create this wonderful theological essay. But if what you're proving is a verse of Scripture, what it says, by a verse over here, and a verse over there, and a philosopher here, and a poet over there, what can you make Scripture say if you approach the Scriptures that way? What can you make Scripture say? Absolutely anything you want. And when the Christian consensus was in place, people would say Christian things. Okay, so they would take that verse and they would kind of develop it in a Christian way and everybody would nod in agreement. But Ross began to recognize there was no defense for the preaching that was saying just about anything based upon a particular verse proven that way. And he began to say, how, how do you preach the scriptures in such a way that you are saying what the text says? That you're a servant of the word, not of the philosophy of the age, not of the opinions of people. How do you maintain the scriptures in their original intent? And so John Broadus devised what was known as the expository method. And when I say it, you'll kind of think, well, doesn't everybody do that? And the answer is no, not everybody does this. The expository method had some basic principles. And the basic principles were these. Number one, the topic comes from the text. That is, the text is establishing what the topic of the message will be. Whatever is the topic of the text, that's the topic of the message. Second principle. Main points come from the text. Whatever you have defined as the, the pericope, the, the idea portion that this author is communicating, his chief idea of that passage of Scripture, your goal is to not only say what his topic was, but to establish the divisions of his thought within the text. How is he proving his point? But then not only the main points, but the subpoints come from the text, which means you're not just bound to the main arguments, you're bound to the development of the argument in the explanation, the development of the narrative, the development of the plot. In essence, what you're being bound to is not the philosophy of the age, you are being bound to authorial intent. Okay, What did the scriptures intend to teach to God's people? What was the truth once for all delivered to the saints? And Paul, what he would say in Romans 15, for everything that was written in the past was written for us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. What was the intent of the author in writing those scriptures? And, and Broadus felt if you follow this method, that you would be bound to the text instead of just being able to wander afar, okay? And uh, that became known as the expository method, and as familiar as that may sound to you, that originated with John Broadus, post-Civil War, which means it had been around in the history of preaching for a long time. Do you know that? It really hasn't. I mean, most preaching through the 20 centuries of preaching up till now have been has been topical preaching, right? Take a verse and theologically comment on it. Whereas Broadus was saying, no, take the text and develop it according to the text. 
Now, I've told you all that because I want you to think, if you were just thinking, all right, John Rawls, all right, he's going to be this great writer on the history and the practice of preaching, particularly expository preaching. So when you think about the traditional components of preaching, which are explanation, illustration, and application, which of those three, does that sound familiar? You know those are kind of the building blocks of any sermon, explanation, illustration, application. John brought us father of expository preaching. Which would he say is the most important? What does your gut say? Which of these is the most important? Explanation. He did not. John Robbins, the father of expository preaching, said, application is the main thing to be done. Why? Because we are not ministers of information. We are ministers of transformation. What's the main knock on expository preaching even today? Even when I begin to put this in front of you, you go, oh, no. More of this. The main knock on expository preaching is that it is boring and irrelevant. Just people regurgitating commentaries at you. <coughs> but the man who actually devised the method changed, as it were, the agenda of the sermon at the very same moment. So that we typically think of, if you're just kind of picturing what an expository sermon is, is it's a sermon in which we are lining up exegesis, and illustration, and the organization, and the delivery, all so that we can move the big stone of explanation. And Broda said that's precisely what we're not doing. He said what we are doing is we are using all of these components to build a foundation of explanation so that we can move the application. Because ultimately, if people do not know the significance of the truth for their lives, they do not know the meaning of the text. After all, they're not going to take a test. They're not theologians. They've got you know, a test on Monday for the sermon you gave on Sunday. That's not what's happening. What you are trusting, what you are hoping, is that you are presenting the truth of the Word of God in such a way that people apply the Word to their lives, truthfully, rightfully, according to its meaning, but the goal is not just to have a data dump, right? The goal is not just to inform people. The goal of the preaching is to build on solid exposition so that there is appropriate application. And that kind of changes as it were what you're thinking is what you're trying to accomplish when we are preaching. That's Broadus, Father Expository Preaching, who says, how important is application? Application is the main thing to be done. He's following in a history of other theologians, like John Calvin. I'm Presbyterian, and you have to know that whenever Presbyterians get close to heresy, they quote John Calvin, because <laughs> he has more credibility than we do, right? So what, what did Calvin say? Calvin said, the doctrine of itself can profit nothing at all. Now, that's not just Calvin. What, what did, did the Apostle Paul say? If all you're trying to do is to gain knowledge, what did he say would happen to you? Knowledge just does what? Puffs up. You think you're gaining knowledge. Your head is just swelling. That's all that happens. Because you're not thinking about what difference will it make. How does, this con how does this transform you as a consequence of truth? So Calvin is saying, if all we do is preach the doctrine, it will profit nothing at all because humanity of itself will not move one foot if all we do is teach them the doctrine. Here's what's true, here's what's true, here's what's true. Great, glad you, glad you think that. So what? Right? If the so what is not being answered, we recognize that the truth is not transforming. It's just being absorbed. We talk about this not just theologically, but our own generational experience. And for those of you who are already pastors in the room, you know this is, this is just plain discouraging. If you look at our culture, even if you looked at our church culture, and you say, how transforming are our messages for the evangelical, Bible-believing churches in which we minister, we just hang our heads. 
right? We, we're here preaching truth, truth, truth. But if you say what's being applied, you know there are huge difficulties. So repeat the statistics that you hear over and over again. And a number of you are young people in the room, but let's just say it. What fraction of young people will leave the evangelical church when they go off to college? They will never attend church again, when they, or they will stop attending church, sorry. They will stop attending church when they go off to college. What percentage of evangelical young people, what fraction of young people will stop going to church when they go to college? Two-thirds. Across the board. Two-thirds will stop attending church as they go off to college. Now, one-third of that two-thirds will come back. When will they come back to the church? When they start having kids. Right? But the reality is that there is this huge washout of aspects of, is this important? Does it apply to my life? And these are people being raised in Bible-believing churches where they hear the Word of God regularly. You know these facts, don't you? The incidence of abortion varies very little between people in Bible-believing churches and the rest of society. Uh, the incidence of divorce varies very little between the rest of society and those who are raised in Bible-believing churches. Now, you and I know that every fact I'm going to mention can be debated, okay? And uh, if you read the stuff of Ed Stetzer very closely, he'll break down the figures a lot more, okay? And he'll say, yes, that's true of those who claim to be evangelicals, but those who regularly attend church, those who regularly pray, you know, the figures change dramatically. And just to be a pastor for a moment, you should recognize that when we talk about that divorce factor, even, even the focus on the family people who debate that Christians divorce at the same rate, for society it's about 50%, right? Even focus on the families that Christians are, are divorcing at 37%. Okay, so 40 versus 50. So even focus, who didn't look, but you get somebody that has steps are coming along and say, but what happens if you pray daily as a family in the home? Then what happens? 90% of those families will never divorce. It's not magic, but it is saying something about the regularity and commitment of the heart versus nominal faith in terms of what people claim. We see it at times on things like drunkenness. I hate to say it, but the reality is, if you look at drunkenness, the incidence particularly of DUI, it actually goes up after people claim to be born again. That is, the percentage of people who are arrested for drunkenness actually goes up after they claim to have been born again. Now, all kinds of sociological reasons for that, right? And we could say, why is that? And so, but here's the reality. The Bible doesn't make much difference in the way people live. So if you begin to say, is application important? I will say, it has to be. Because simply telling people what is true has not transformed them. And we have evidence after evidence after evidence to say that is the case. We have to say it's not only important to do application because of the way people respond. Application is important because of the way they listen. How do they hear our sermons? Often we think, well, if I say a lot of you know, Greek and Hebrew terms, if I make it really organized and maybe really clear, I'll be really impressive and people will listen to me. Now, you're smiling because you know that's not true. But we have to say, then, then why do people listen to what we say? Uh, many, many years ago, Aristotle said any persuasive, anything that you communicate to people, if it's going to persuade, has certain key elements in it. This is true of preaching, it's true of any rhetorical message at all. Any rhetorical message has a portion that is its logos component. What's logos mean? Word. We would say there's verbal content. Okay? There's the verbal content of the message. It has no verbal content. It can't be received. It can't be believed. It can't be acted upon. So the verbal content, the logos element of the verbal message includes not just what's true in the message, not just your exegesis, but even your organization. Okay? Can it be understood? Right? So is, is there verbal content communicated in a way that is clear and has adequate content? A second part of any persuasive message is its pathos. In order to persuade, there has to be pathos. What's pathos? If logos is verbal element, what's pathos? The passion or emotive element. The emotive element of what you say. 
because of the old rubric in preaching, if manner contradicts message, what will be believed? Manner. If manner contradicts message, it's manner that will be believed. So if I say to you, this is really important, you know, you ought to listen or you'll go to hell. <laughs> now I said this is really important, but what did my manner say? It's not important at all. So we forget because we're suspicious of emotions that the manner of our delivery is our first testimony of its truth. Okay? We are confirming this is true. It's had an impact upon me. So if there is no apparent impact upon me, I'm actually undercutting the truth as though it's unimportant. Or I can even contradict it, right? I can say, you know what? What this church really needs is people who will just love each other a little more. <laughs> well, somehow that manner doesn't help that message along very much, right? We recognize that manner and message have to coincide for a message to be believable. And for, you know, for particularly males in North American culture, where we want to be the great stone face, you know, the impassive, immovable, right? And, and not kind of reflect emotion. We, we don't recognize at times we're saying to people, this isn't very important or dear or passionate. I'm not passionate because we, we don't want to show our emotions. But in whatever is true to our personalities, if we are not saying this is true as though it is very important to us, then we actually contradict it. You think of the Prince of Preachers, Spurgeon, right? So Spurgeon said, what that means is, when, you're, when you speak of heaven, your face should irradiate the joy of the eternal. And when you speak of hell, well, then your regular face will do. <laughs> Manner needs to conform to message. But the last part, of any persuasive message is ethos, which is the perceived character of the speaker, the perceived character of the speaker. We all experience this when we hear truth from someone we distrust. So, um, Michael, I, some of you in the room, may have been preaching in a nation like Ireland for maybe the last 20 years. If you were preaching in Ireland 15 years ago, you were preaching in a nation where roughly, roughly 